has provided information on the decision-making process from the Fish and Wildlife Service perspective about the determination of priorities uh, for listing species and conserving species. And so I'm entering the discussion at that point where the decision has already been made. Uh, a species or an extremely small representation of a species has been protected in terms of designating some habitat for the protection. Now what happens next? Is it fully protected? No, we, we need to implement management tools. So that's where I'm going to be picking up the conversation. Center for Natural Lands Management, how many of you have heard of this organization prior to today? I'm, I'm surprised. I had not heard of this organization before, <laughs> before I joined them. Uh, but this, <laughs> well, I came out during the interview. Um, but the, uh, the Center for Natural Lands Management could just as easily be called the Center for Extremely Small Population Management. And in fact, I'm going to recommend that change to our uh, board of directors because at least we get a vowel that way. Um, <laughs> this, this cannot be pronounced. Uh, another little bit about context because context is so important in terms of how you integrate or take home anything from the presentations that you've been hearing today is context. Uh, the preserves that we own and, and manage all have extremely small populations listed species and they're all managed um, in perpetuity. They all have uh, perpetual funding sources. And it's generally within the geographic context of California and Washington states. So the um, sort of conceptual foundation, so this is where my message is. Uh, the conceptual foundation of my message is that, or maybe conceptual foundation is a too high polluting. What I mean is uh, my particular bias that's well pr provided by facts. Um, so the conceptual foundation is that Conservation, true effective conservation or protection of those extremely small populations is only effective when it's a function of at least three components. Um, stewardship, which of course needs to be science-based, at least in principle, if not through specific information. It needs to be accompanied by the legal tools, appropriate land use restrictions, which are not just on paper, but actually well implemented. And third, uh, appropriate and secure funding so that those legal tools can be implemented and stewardship can be provided to the extremely small populations. And of course, that's only going to be ultimately effective if it can potentially be carried out through perpetuity. So that's my conceit, my bias, my conceptual foundation. And the rest is just detail. But I am going to give you a few details, if for no other reason to show you more great pictures of some ESPs so I don't think we've seen this one yet, uh, the blunt nosed uh, leopard lizard. Um, just a few points about why managing extremely small populations is different and more challenging than, than managing widespread species or more robust populations. You know about the science, you know about all the, the genetic issues of extremely small populations. But just in general, it's more challenging, first of all, because there often is a lack of information. Um, and so we're not just um, we're not just working based trying to implement uh, science-based species-specific information. We're often operating on the basis of scientific principles, and then looking for appropriate uh, taxa, maybe congeneric species is the closest that we can get. So acting in a, sort of a vacuum of information often. Uncertainty of reference for management goals. By that I mean. Extremely small populations that are not extremely small by virtue of being naturally rare. That is, extremely small populations that are that way because of impacts and restrictions to their range, habitat degradation. So they're artificially rare. Those species may in fact not, the remaining populations may not be the core populations. They may not be the most robust populations that have sort of the typical relationships with their abiotic and biotic communities. Uh, they may be the, the edge populations, the ones that aren't in their preferred habitat but are just able to hang on in that habitat. And these sometimes are the ones that we're managing. So we have to be extremely careful about taking lessons or making assumptions 
that the, the situations in which those extremely small populations reside represent preferences or ideal conditions. Mm -hmm. So that's just another twist for we managers of those ESPs. And third, there is often a need for getting additional species-specific information, or in some cases, even population-specific information, before we can confidently apply a management tool. So I'll give you a couple examples of that. So first of all, at the species level, we need to approach management extremely cautiously, because in this case, we can't afford much risk. We can't afford much loss if our management technique doesn't work. We can't say, oh, well, there's another one. Um, so we have to approach it with a great deal of caution. Uh, so even when we're using a, you know, a routine tool like a herbicide, we may be able to look to the label directions of glyphosate, Roundup, to figure out what rate we should be applying to kill the target weed. It doesn't say anything about what is safe for the listed species. So we have to be extremely careful in our management tools so that we're not just being effective in managing against the threat but we have to be concerned about not presenting an additional risk to the endangered population. So that's at the species level. Sometimes, even at the population level, we need to acquire additional information before we take a management action. Uh, something that comes to mind quite easily and naturally is that of genetic diversity. Any population geneticist is aware that across the range of a species, genetic diversity may not be evenly distributed. So even if we know something about the genetic, uh, the population structure or genetic diversity within the species, we can't necessarily assume that that's true for a particular population. So this is a case where we were approached. This is not even a, a, a listed species. It's a CMPS 1B species, but we care about it, and it's on one of our preserves. We were approached by a, a certain entity who wanted us to consider accepting uh, a, a a transplanted population of this species onto our preserve. And they said, you know what? It's only a few kilometers away. Why don't you just do this? And we said, well, but we don't know anything about the genetic diversity of the species. And we think that we might be placing our population at risk. So what we did was conducted one of those wonderful, quaint, and still relevant uh, common garden studies uh, to look at genetic diversity, and not just not neutral genetic diversity, but we had a common garden study. We were looking at a number of traits that potentially have adaptive value. And guess what? We found that even though that other population, and I use the term population very loosely, uh, that other occurrence was only a few kilometers away, there was, in fact, a significant, potentially biologically significant, genetic difference in some traits of interest. So our management decision was no, it's not appropriate to transplant that population onto our preserve. So we all know, whether you're, regardless of the discipline within biology um, that you've uh, devoted much time to, we all know at this point general principles of good preserve design. The problem is that sometimes, perhaps often, we can't implement them. Uh, by any standard, that preserve, which is in that yellow-green color on the screen, that preserve does not have a good ratio of edge to core. I, I think <laughs> I can <laughs> And even though you can't tell, I'll let you know that there is no buffer. <laughs> That's in violation of every principle of good preserve design. But again, with these extremely small populations, you're often very limited and where the preserve can be. It's a given. You don't get to design. You get to accept or not. Uh, so this is an example of many such preserves. Uh, this one happens to be in Orange County. And talk about edge effects. So this one is uh, the focal species here is the federally threatened coastal California gnatcatcher. Uh, there are three principal uh, sources of significant edge effect for this preserve. One of them represented by um, active um, oil extraction, one of them represented by high-density residential, and the third by a golf course. Any of you want to speculate on where most of the problems come from? Residential. Yeah. Residential. Uh, many, many yes. problems come from residential, but actually the, the preserve manager who's dedicated to that preserve spends most of his time dealing with the golf course owners because they have a very 
apparently the course needs to be green. And <laughs> <laughs> so there are many issues there. <laughs> okay, so managing, this is just, this slide is going to speak volumes because we don't have the time for me to do that. Uh, a, a standard component of management for extremely small populations is monitoring. We need, and we monitor typically, not just the focus species, the ESP, the enlisted species, but we're also then uh, monitoring the biotic community, uh, looking for shifts in the species competition. Uh, not only because we want to better understand the habitat and the context for that primary focus, the listed species and the ESP, uh, but also sometimes monitoring something other than the species itself will give us an earlier warning uh, that there's a bad trend unfolding and that gives us more opportunities as managers to take some corrective action if there is any. Uh, a second typical component of management is doing some restoration. We're typically, again, trying, <coughs> in a general sense, trying to shift the balance from non-natives back to a higher percentage of native species. Sometimes when there is a very specific need, when we've identified a key limitation to a particular species, as there was with the brewing owl on the set of preserves in Riverside County, we might take a very specific action and in this case, installing artificial burrows. I was talking with Ron about that during lunch. And the idea sometimes with these management actions, it's not to replace what would be natural. Of course, the best and probably the long-term remedy is to have to restore the whole ecosystem so burrows are there if they are limited, that they're, near, they're naturally and they're naturally maintained. Um, however, sometimes an artificial gesture will abridge the gap while that longer term process is being restored. And also in this case, it allows us a research opportunity because borough availability and microsite differences are confounded in the wild. And by putting in some artificial burrows, it has set up a nice situation so that we can perhaps tease out those differences between the, the habitat preferences of a burrowing owl separate from the location of the burrows. Does that make sense? Good, I'm invalidated, okay. Um, so we're often managing for the species, but we're up, or the ESP, we're also managing against the threats for those species. Typically, the, the, probably the highest draw on our budgets annually is in combating non-native uh, invasive uh, plant species, also known as weeds. Um, we also devote a fair amount of effort, though, to some other uh, species such as um, eradication of bullfrogs and crayfish have been mentioned, uh, and um, brownhead cowbirds. Landscape level effects, what can we possibly do about those? Well, we try to take a regional approach through, you know, partnerships and relationships have been a theme throughout the symposium, so we try to engage in regional efforts. Uh, so that we're not just looking at a preserve in isolation. In this particular case, we do have uh, a very small, just 30 acre preserve in San Joaquin County that is home for an endangered species riparian brush rabbit, and we're very concerned. We've already seen evidence in the last uh, 15 years or so about flood levels uh, potentially displacing uh, the species, and there's no bridge, there's no connectivity. Uh, so here we're looking into the possibility of doing some um, restoration that would, I'm not sure you call it restoration enhancement, uh, towards providing a high water refusion for that species. And the other major category of threats that we manage against are me and every one of you. Our, our species is not very well behaved. And even though most of our preserves are off limits to the public, uh, well fenced, well signed, um, we have differences of opinion with the public about the best use of those preserves. And people see them as green spaces and recreational opportunities. And I certainly understand and empathize, uh, but they do do harm. Uh, in two of these pictures, we do have public trails, but you can see, in, well, you can't see it, but we have a large sign at the beginning of the trail in the lower left-hand corner, uh, indicating that absolutely no dogs are allowed. But people find ways to rationalize their exceptions. In this case, it was explained they were very small dogs. Um, <laughs> but to a coastal California gnat catcher, that's a huge threat. 
Um, and this is a case in the other corner of the screen of people just loving the preserve to death, as we know is true for Yosemite, for example, where we have erosion, even though it was a very well-designed uh, trail system. Um, other threats from our species aren't so benign or incidental, but they're just direct uh, degradation of the site. How mundane, but this is a huge threat to those ESPs and one that we actively manage against. And then finally, there are a few examples of just unexpected challenges that the managers of ESPs have. So for example, we have this embarrassing situation on one of our preserves in the state of Washington where a federal candidate and state endangered uh, species Taylor's checker spot butterfly has shown preference for a non-native plant. So that's put the preserve manager in a tricky situation. And I believe one of her colleagues um, has also done some longer term genetic studies on this relationship and believes that there's evidence of adaptation. So it's not necessarily just simply a matter of planting more of the natives. Again, it's one of those messy situations. Uh, another somewhat messy situation, but I think increasingly common, is that of competition between two or more ESPs or listed species uh, that creates a management of dilemma of who do we favor or how, where do we um, draw the line or provide the balance. So this is a case of a fairly large preserve in Riverside County that was initially determined um, uh, for the protection of the Stevens kangaroo rat. We've seen that this is another theme in our, our symposium, the cute little Stevens kangaroo rat. What were we going to call it again? Pocket kangaroo. Pocket kangaroos. All right. No pocket rats, kangaroo. not a rat. <laughs> That's right. So the pocket kangaroo uh, <laughs> enjoys uh, what one of our preserve manager calls, you know, just scruffy habitat. Crappy habitat, it likes. Uh, you know, grassy areas with a lot of open spaces so they can have those cute little dirt baths. Um, however, in the lower corner of the preserve, the southern part of the preserve, where you can see some green, and our preserve managers call it the fish, fish hook for obvious reasons. Thanks to urban rule, we are getting some creation of artificial riparian habitat, which has been um, discovered by the least bells area. Uh, so now that our preserve manager is trying to determine how to manage that balance because certainly the riparian habitat is not prime habitat for Stevens kangaroo rat. Just one more example of that same uh, issue is another one concerning a cute little Pacific pocket mouse. So that one does have a, a name that uh, can get some public empathy. And also on that uh, 30 acre or so preserve in Orange County, is the Coast of California gnat catcher. Um, and even though they're both there naturally, they have different habitat preferences in terms of the amount of shrubby, you know, woody vegetation. So again, the preserve manager has to do a balancing act there. So those are some of the management challenges that at least, if not specific to ESPs, okay. I'm so glad that we've already had presentations about law and economics because I'm going to go through this at a level that only your subconscious is going to keep up with. <laughs> um, but what here, the main message here that's going to come across in the next couple of slides about law is that law may begin with these wonderful statutes, the Endangered Species Act and others uh, that Lisa was discussing, but they need to be implemented and they need to be defended. And also, it's my, my personal uh, experience that often they're more effective uh, when there's actually input to them, at least the, um, the uh, laws that come further downstream. If there's specific input to them uh, with information safeguarding that species or that preserve. Uh, so just as examples, we get involved as managers in the drafting of conservation easements where we can put in prohibitions, prohibited activities that are specific to that habitat type or that ESP. And we know all about problems, supportive practices, again, to the extent that those legal tools can be made more specific to that species uh, when there's a conservation easement in place. It needs to be monitored to determine whether or not there are any violations. Other words, as my dad would say, and probably every one of your fathers would say, it's just ink on paper. So we as managers do get involved in monitoring, managing 
and in some cases defending conservation easements, and I won't say more about that. Finally, the, the last pillar uh, is that of providing uh, sufficient uh, funding in perpetuity, a secure amount of funding so that we can have uh, the defense, uh, appropriate defense and appropriate management activities. Um, appropriate amount needs to be determined. That's where the managers get involved. Who better knows exactly what's going to be required to do management and what it's going to cost. Uh, and endowment is one form of a, of, of a financial tool uh, that can help ensure that there's funding available in perpetuity as opposed to relying on public donations on an annual basis. And I won't say more about that. I do want to say specifically, this is something we could perhaps get into later, but very quickly last night I looked at about 16 of our preserves where we had done the financial analysis, determined what it was going to cost to manage that particular listed species or ESP on that preserve. I looked, so even though there's a lot of variety here in the data set in terms of the, the exact species, uh, they're all, the, the cal financial calculation was all done by the same entity, so there's the same overhead rate and so forth. And what you can see, even without any curve fitting, I hope, is that as the preserve, well, first of all, those numbers are fairly high, anywhere from about $50 an acre to almost $2,000 an acre uh, for management. And the second message is that the smaller the preserve size, the much greater the expense per management unit. And what those numbers come out to in absolute amounts are anywhere from about $30,000 per preserve to $300,000 per preserve per year. That's annual operating budget. So it's extremely expensive. I want to end by saying that our stewardship policy, which you, you might think is about the nuts and the bolts of management and talks about science and conservation biology principles, it clearly states that it's important to manage the financial resources along with uh, the biological resources because without the finances, we can't defend the biology. And just in closing, I'll say that all of the speakers have talked about um, the what and the how, and I've learned a great deal today. Um, but I think we don't ask, need to ask the question, why?